Nothing has been sacred since I was 11 years old, when I first began to question all assumptions, including reality itself. And that locked me in a metaphysical conundrum that led to the brain in the box. And as we evaporate away, we have nothing left but that of nothingness. So, naturally, I turned to science to study the smallest primitives of the universe in order to figure out if they could provide an answer to metaphysics and reality. Naturally, that would be the atom and the orbital states of the electron and consequently quantum mechanics. So, in that process, I'd like to kind of give a quick synopsis of quantum mechanics. We have an electron at orbital state 5, and it jumps to orbital state 2. We can jump back and forth. <coughs> and the interesting thing here <coughs> that you might have heard is that it actually teleports from these two states. It doesn't move in between, it doesn't move between the space. It teleports. Right? So the difference between those two states is negative 3 from 5 to 2. You have a delta difference of negative 3. That is quantifiable. And literally, that is where quantum mechanics comes into play. Quantum mechanics is the quantifiable difference between these orbital states. That's the world of quantum mechanics. However, the further and further you get into quantum physics, uh, with Schrodinger's cat, multi-world theorem, wave-particle duality, you kind of discover that it doesn't really hold any good answers for materialistic kind of existence or giving you a basis for understanding reality. So with that, I decided I needed to go even further down the rabbit hole of questioning assumptions beyond science down to logic itself. Now naturally, logic corresponds a lot to computer programming. So when I was 16, after using logic for about seven years, I had developed a metaphysical proof for reality. But once I had done that, I no longer you know, was just sitting around all day, all night, trying to figure out whether you know, I exist, whether this hand is real. And once I had done that, right, I had a bunch of spare time in my hands. So if I'd already gotten into kind of the logic side of the equation, computers, might as well learn how to do HTML and CSS since that was the natural path. I wanted to be able to take my metaphysical theory, which would be about six hours of Socratic dialogue in order for me to explain, but I wanted to be able to present it to everybody. I wanted to be able to explain my concepts. So, of course, naturally I go to the best publishing platform in the world, the web, which requires learning HTML and CSS. Let's just say that CSS would not make for a good metaphysical framework because it is incredibly inconsistent, unless you wanted a reality that was completely fractured. So take this left side CSS and this right side CSS. These two pages are exactly the same with only one difference, which is the overflow attribute. Now, the overflow attribute of CSS does something really simple, at least how it's described. If you have a container and you have content inside of the container and the content overflows the limits of the container, you got a couple options. Either the box will scroll, it'll clip it so you can't see it, or the content will just flow past it and it's visible. Now, if you notice that my containers just have a content of A and B, so they're not, the content isn't big enough to trigger an overflow. So you should think, according to CSS, that well, you know, these will render exactly the same because the overflow attribute, okay, nope. What overflow does is it consequently changes the entire rendering layout engine. It affects how the actual boxes are displayed on screen. And this isn't just like a Chrome quirk. This is like across all browsers. So CSS, ah. Uh, miserable. And I'm glad we had CSS Conf because I, I did learn some tricks, like vertical centering now. Yay! <laughs> so that puts us back in the black box, right? What are we going to do to answer, to solve for these problems? 
So I decided, OK, if CSS and HTML can't handle it, I should actually pick up the logic side of the equation, JavaScript. I could probably fairly easily create a JavaScript library tool in order to create a uniform CSS that would give me a consistent reality or at least a consistent web page. And so when I was 16, actually when I was 18, I created Excelsior. And Excelsior is a tool that using a whole bunch of JavaScript, using Turing complete logic, and I kind of want to zoom out here and say that programming for the most part is just three things. It's data, it's manipulation of that data, and it is communication. And with inside of JavaScript, you, you know, those categories break down where you have your primitives, you have loops, you have if statements. With these eight basic primitives, you can essentially build everything. You can build Minecraft, and Minecraft is Turing complete. And inside of Minecraft, you could implement a JavaScript interpreter, which then interprets Ruby, which interprets JavaScript, so on. So these are the tools that you want to use. They are the lowest level things that you can build anything that you want on top of. Now with that, I was able to do something really cool with CSS and HTML. I built this tool, Excelsior, as I mentioned, that allowed me to change the background color, that allowed me to change the margin, the box shadow, the b border radius, you know, all this stuff as I'm interacting with it right inside of the web browser. So kind of my ultimate web designer tool that's running inside of the browser and gives me kind of, I can actually use the keyboard, kind of like a video game. I can, I can push on the keyboard. Every individual um, CSS and HTML property is bound to some key on the keyboard. So it's giving me a really, really fast way to not only prototype the HTML and CSS and see it as I react with it, but more importantly, is giving me that instant feedback that I could then iterate on top of. And it's flexible because I'm trying to just build it on top of the already existing kind of CSS HTML, not do too many assumptions on top, keeping things flexible. So naturally, I wanted to get that you know, CSS HTML that's updating as I was manipulating it. I wanted every single person that came to my website to see that in real time. Okay? So I wanted all of these changes to propagate out Toward, to everybody that was on the website. And in that sense, I'm generating a lot of data. I'm generating a lot of deltas. Okay? And I needed to store that data someplace. And unfortunately, you know, as I mentioned, there's the, the data manipulation communication. Manipulation and communication in JavaScript, it's a little wonky, but it does the job. But the data aspect, okay? There's not really a JavaScript database. Well, OK, now we actually have a bunch of JavaScript databases like DAT and uh, pretty much a quarter of the people that I met the first day were working on a JavaScript database. But regardless of whether it's JavaScript or not, we really only had two ways to express data, which is in a table, SQL, or as a tree, um, a document-based storage such as MongoDB. But I don't know about you, my data isn't really that clean. It looks more like this. My data, trying to kind of express reality, is a bunch of intricately interconnected, just massive blobs of messy junk. I don't even know exactly what it is, but it's, it's there, right? So trying to express this in a clean way, in a table or in a tree, it's just kind of unrealistic. So that's just one aspect of the data side, right? Which is I needed it to be um, graph-based to handle the complexity of intricately related data. I also needed it to be distributed, decentralized, okay? Because if I have two people that are editing the same page collaboratively and they're on the other side of the world or the, you know, the network goes out, I needed it to be able to still work. So I started GUN, and GUN is a distributed JavaScript database. Now, as soon as you get into decentralized stuff, distributed stuff, you encounter what, quote, the experts of database say is hard and complicated, concurrency control, and Paxos, and master-slave replication, and, and quorum, and all this stuff. But I want to kind of dethrone the experts and say, if we spent more time actually describing what's happening and bringing more people into the field and looking at the fresh kind of perspective that they have on the data and on the problems, 
we will be able to make more progress than simply being dismissive of the stuff. And things get difficult because of the problem of time. Okay? So, as an illustration, let's go into nonlinear time. By raise of hands in the audience, just a very simple question, who would say that these two cars are different? Yeah? Okay, cool. Yeah? That one's blue, one's red, they're different cars, right? But if we reframe this from a time perspective, right, we get something a little bit interesting. <clears throat> now that you've seen this time series of mutable data, right, where you have the car and my stick figure comes along and paints it to be blue, how many of you guys would now say that this car is different? Okay, good, good. Uh, very, very good. A, a lot of people, though, however, might think this car is the same because as a consequence of change over time, um, it's still the, quote, original car. But this poses a problem that's answered more by our perception, okay? And I don't mean perception in some, like, Hindu mysticism type way. I mean it in the sense of quantum mechanics, right? When the photon comes from the car of the red or blue car, and it hits our eyeball, one of the atoms in our eyeball, you know, reacts to that photon and goes from the orbital state of, let's say, two, and it absorbs the photon and jumps up to the orbital state of five, uh, whatever it may be, the delta difference. So perception or observation is measurement, okay? And when we measure something, we're fundamentally affecting or changing its nature. We are mutating it. It is mutable data. So, again, as I stated, right, we have the difference, the quantifiable delta from the two orbital states. Now, this kind of gets interesting because I want to talk about houseplants. Your innocent, docile, cute little houseplant. Well, I have some bad news. It's actually a man in the middle attack. Your houseplant is actually a malicious peer in your kind of network topology. Because what it's doing is it's taking the, the source of the light, right, which is kind of, you could say, bouncing. It's not really bouncing off of the plant. But the plant is absorbing the information from the light. It is absorbing all the spectrum of light. And it's corrupting the data. It's filtering out all the data except for green. And then it's sending, it's relaying back to you this color of green. So you receive it on your eyeballs and you see that the plant is green. In reality, or let's say metaphysics, the plant is everything but green because it absorbed all the other energy levels except for green. Green is the only one that it sent back to you because it's trying to kind of screw with your mind, it's screw with your perception. It is a man in the middle attack, okay? But this leads to some interesting you know, questions like, right, we, we like that plants are green. Now, are we going to suddenly ban all plants from our network, because, all of our house plants from our network because you know, it's doing this man in the middle attack? Uh, the very kind of structure of the plant is how it is changing and corrupting the data. Again, it comes back to the perceptual component. However, <laughs> The brain is doing something similar, and I can express this by an interesting factoid that you may, may or may not know, is neurosurgeons have removed half of a patient's brain, okay? And you think that if you removed half of your brain, you would, like, die, right? Or, you know, not be able to walk, or you'd lose your memories, or your, your personality, your psychology would change. But no, we've found that if you remove half of somebody's brain, for the most part, if you do it appropriately, they survive, and not only do they survive, but they have all their memories still intact. That's, that's incredible. Their personality doesn't change. They still have their memories. So the brain itself is working as a distributed system. It's storing your memories replicated across the graph of your neurons. So if only our database could do this, right? Somehow, if we could have the same sort of consistency and replication that our brain does, and if we lose one server, you know, it's fault tolerant, you know, that's the whole point of sharding, et cetera, et cetera, master-slave replication. But I actually want to reframe this again a little bit more. Put it in the black box and say, this seems familiar. All this stuff kind of looks like, well, atoms, right? In order to have this appropriately, we have to have idempotent data transformations, and that's fancy words, but all it really means is that when I have the orbital state change, 
a mutation in state, and that gets emitted out to these other atoms. Or maybe I should pseudoscientifically say, like, let's, let's look at these things as servers, right? And so as it's emitted out, replicated, that, that photon, that delta, that quantifiable change, is then absorbed by these other atoms. And the electron goes from the lower orbital state to the higher orbital state. But what's interesting is that <clears throat> in servers, we want some sort of guarantee of um, the message being rebroadcasted. Okay? So each server, let's say, rebroadcasts the message that it gets, separate from how it processes the data. And as a result, this guy down here, let's just call him Carl, gets the message twice. So it's important that Carl deduplicates that message, that he doesn't uh, process the message in the same way. And what's exciting about this is we actually kind of see this in light. You might have heard that light doesn't really act as a particle. It doesn't re even really act as a wave. It acts more like probability. A, a photon can travel in any possible path. It can spin around, do loops, and then come back around to you. And we actually kind of see this with the, the rebroadcasting in the sense of our servers. If we have multiple servers interconnected with each other, there's multiple paths that the information can take. So to express this in a more salient human perspective, let's say, sadly, that Carl's mother has died. Okay? But he doesn't know it. Alice knows it. So Alice tries to contact Carl directly, and Carl picks up, and Alice tells him that his mother has died. Carl reacts quite strongly with emotional trauma of hearing that his mother has died. But let's rewind a little bit. Let's say Alice was not able to communicate with Carl directly. So Alice kind of calls up Bob and tells Bob the news, hoping that Bob may somehow get a connection to Carl, and then Bob relays the news to Carl. And remember, uh, Carl hasn't heard about this yet, so when Carl hears the news from Bob, he reacts strongly because this is the first time he's heard the news. It's, it's a traumatic experience. But now let's rewind again. Okay, Alice has heard of the news. And rather than doing one or the other, Alice does both. Okay, And as a result, Carl is going to get the news of his mother's death, the trauma, twice. Now, the important yet sad part of this is that Carl's reaction is what's called idempotent. When he hears the news the first time, that's where he has the reactional trauma. The second time he hears it, of course, it's sad, but he already knows the information, right? It doesn't affect his state, per se, okay? And so from that perspective is we can take any multiple path when we want to communicate to a server or something, and the data will all resolve. And, and the fastest path is going to be the probabilistic one, the one in which it has the lowest latency, the, the closest connection. So kind of this represents a lot of my research with GUN. And I actually have, it's not just all theory and metaphysics and stuff. I actually have this working. And I would love to have you guys all try it out, NPM install. I'm just getting started. I have an MVP. And I'm excited to announce I just got funding this week. So if anybody wants to work on distributed JavaScript systems for fun or for pay, please let me know. But I want to go back to something that I started with, right? which is we have our mind. And I want to end with this, which is our mind is perceiving the world around us, but how do we know that that's real, the metaphysics of it? And as I was studying these things, I started to go a little crazy because you know, I'm starting to hallucinate that there's this computer in front of me that I'm typing code in, that I have this body on me, right? And slowly as I realized that data itself, in the sense of the replication, the idempotent transformation of data as it's being broadcasted, is actually a way that I can look at metaphysics, right? This, this stand right here, a thousand years ago, was not in that locality. It's not in that position. And so I should just be able to, you know, wipe my hand through it. But, well, you know, that didn't work. But that's because the stand and me share a common state relative to each other. And that is kind of the transformation of that data through these atoms or through these servers. But I want to go a little bit further and maybe propose something a tad too pseudoscientific, which is what if our minds themselves, our perception, are operating in that state? What if mental illnesses such as schizophrenia or 
um, dissociative identity disorder, are simply a person who has a conflict resolution algorithm, a synchronization algorithm, a replication log that doesn't work the same way that we do. So take a schizophrenic. He sees things that aren't actually there. He hears things that aren't actually there. But what if that's just because, in the same way where you had the example of the Alice and the Bob and the mother dying, that kind of replication log in his brain is simply operating at a different synchronization algorithm than the rest of us. So they're perceiving a reality at a fundamentally different state in the context compared to what we are. Now, that's probably pushing a little bit too far, but I'm just jokingly suggest that maybe the grand unifying theory of existence is data replication, data synchronization, and with that, I'd like to end. Nothing is sacred, question all things, and in that process, you only learn a ton, but you might discover really interesting things. Thank you.